Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Paul Tremblay, who is a uh, an author of horror. Uh, in, he's in the horror genre. And uh, Paul, could for readers unfamiliar with your work, could you please tell people what you just des describe what you write? <laughs> uh, I, I'm laughing because I don't know how I, um, I was thinking of jokey ways of describing it. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I would say like you know, I, horror, literary horror, however you want to describe it. Uh, many of my novels sort of play with ambiguity. Um, I think most of my horror stuff, like maybe sort of the thing that's sort of my little corner of the horror genre is like I really try to make the stories feel like they could actually happen. Um, yeah, so that's I'll stop there with a rambling description of my writing. Okay. And um, what can readers expect from your newest book? So uh, the Paul Bears Club, which came out summer of 22, the, the paperback is coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, so that book's a, a strange one, both in terms of story and presentation, I think. Uh, you know, the, the title itself references a, uh, a club that this uh, high school student in the late 80s started. Um, and he started as a way to get an extracurricular activity for his, you know, his looming college applications or where he volunteers at a local funeral home to serve elderly and homeless that don't have any or, or very many living relatives. Um, and, you know, he, he's sort of like a loner in high school, so he doesn't have that many, very many friends and not that many people join his club. But eventually this strange older, although he's not sure how much older woman joins the club and she becomes this weird lifelong friend or frenemy uh, of my character. The book itself is presented as a found memoir of this character who calls himself Art Barbara. Um, and sort of the weird part of the, or hopefully the fun part of the presentation is that this woman who joins his club, Mercy, she finds his memoir and she actually annotates it. Like she'll cross out stuff in the margins and write, you know, write little notes in the margins. And, um, you know, the book was published that way, which is a lot of fun. Oh, that sounds I guess great. the horror part of it is she may or may not be a vampire from like a weird section of New England, you know, folk history. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, what do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? Uh, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I think there are so many different types of horror readers, just as there are so many types of horror writers. Like I know like a lot of horror readers like sort of the, the roller coaster aspect of it. You know, I, I know a lot of readers like the idea of being able to overcome like their fears or experiencing fears in a safe manner with a book as opposed to in real life. You know, for me, I don't know. I find horror because um, I don't like roller coasters <laughs> in real life. I mean, I love horror, obviously. So I don't think that's the appeal for me. Uh, I don't know. I think horror is really, you know, when it's done well, it can be really honest um, and get at, I don't know, like the stickiest questions that all art asks, right? Like, you know, so often art asks, like, how do we live through this? How do we live you know, through what we're experiencing, I think horror can get at that in really interesting ways. Um, and that part of it excites me, the idea that horror sort of reveals this, you know, terrible truth, which, you know, <laughs> when said that way, it sounds like it's really depressing, but I actually find that very hopeful, just the idea that, you know, within this reveal of something horrible is happening, you know, I, I take hope from the idea that the reader and the writer sort of both recognize, oh, there's something terribly wrong. Um, it's that act of communication to me is a hopeful thing. I don't know. And plus monsters are cool. <laughs> there's so there's certainly that part of it too. So is, is that how you got into writing horror? Yeah. I mean, I grew up, uh, I mean, my, my earliest memories of like, of pop culture stuff is like watching horror movies and the, you know, so I know we're in the new England area and you probably remember, I don't know if you're from new England originally, but yeah. maybe you remember the show creature double feature that used to be on channel 56, you know, free oh, yeah. cable TV. You know, oh, yeah. so when I was like seven, eight, nine, you know, I would watch that every weekend. And, you know, what drew me in was the first movie was almost always Godzilla or Gamera, a kaiju mm -hmm. movie. You know, I love dinosaurs like most kids did. <laughs> so like, you know, Godzilla was like a, just an extra special dinosaur to me. <laughs> but then, you know, the second movie was a horror movie, um, you know, usually black and white, usually pretty bad too, like Attack of the Killer Shrews or Attack of the Giant Leeches, anything with Attack in the title. But those movies always terrified me. I mean, uh, even something as silly as Attack of the Killer Shrews, I remember having an Attack of the Killer Shrews nightmare pretty vividly. Um, so I don't know. I'd always had like this uh, 
love and you know, a love hate relationship with horror, but a love terrified relationship with it. You know, because I was an awful scaredy cat as a kid and would sleep with stuffed animals around my head. You know, as a your fortress. parents would actually your parents would actually let you watch these movies. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the part of it was, you know, I was an '80s kid. A lot of us sort of were like latchkey kids and would just come home and. Uh. Uh, you know, I did sleep, I shared a bedroom with my brother. So, like, I don't know if they ever knew how much, like, those movies really bothered me. You know, it wasn't like I was watching, like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something like that. Oh. Although my, my brother was when he was, like, 10. That's a different story. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, I've always just, horror has always been, like, a part of my life. Uh, to the point where, you know, when pe- usually in conversation when it comes up, I'm a horror writer. Usually people are like, oh, I can't read stuff like that. And I'm supposed to say, oh, yeah, no, I get it. But... <laughs> Maybe I'll start saying why. Like I don't understand you. Like how 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 are you not interested in horror? To me, you know, it's such an important part of my life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what was the inspiration for uh, for your latest book, for the Paul Bears? Yeah. So funny. Like I uh, so I teach high school math at a small school, a uh, small mm-hmm. private school in Massachusetts, and it was November of 2019. I had just finished turn in edits for my prior novel survivor song which weirdly enough was about an outbreak of a super rabies virus like and i wrote it in the months before the pandemic happened but anyway so you know that book and the book before it the cabinet at the end of the world both took place over really compressed timelines like cabin really only takes place over a day survivor song with the exception of maybe the postlude at the end takes place over like six hours and I found those two books, you know, I love those two books, but I want to do something different. I found myself exhausted at that, like, compressed timeline thing. So in my head, I had no idea of what I wanted to write, but I was looking for something that would be a little bit more expansive time-wise. Um, so with that in mind, it was like no, November of 2019 at my school every Monday morning, they forced the teachers and the kids to come to uh, what they call a corporate chapel where they make announcements in the morning. And then a, a senior went up at the end after people give speeches and he said, hey, I'm starting this thing called the Paul Bearers Club. And I instantly, you know, did a double take. I was like, what? You know, and he described what the Paul Bearers Club was going to be as I described it, what it was for the book. You know, and the teacher, me, thought, oh, what a nice you know, community service thing to do. But the horror writer, me, was like, I have to use this somehow. <laughs> um, yeah, so it started with a title. Like, how am I going to make this book the Paul Bearers Club? Um, so I had the title. I had the club. And because a senior went up and made this announcement, I, I thought of myself as a high school senior, um, you know, who was very, you know, shy, awkward, not confident, you know, had scoliosis and, you know, and other stuff. I was like, there's no way I would have done that as a senior. So instantly that seemed like uh, a nice point of um, conflict. Like, oh, I'm going to make the poor high school me, <laughs> you know, start this club and really make, you know, you know, make that high school version of me a character of the book. And that's really sort of how it started spooling out. Um and then I needed something, uh, a supernatural element or maybe ambiguous supernatural element. So I, I happened to stumble across the story of Mercy Brown, sort of a minor spoiler, but that's revealed like within the first 50 or 60 pages of the book. Uh, and Mercy Brown is this. Well, I mean, she's real. I don't want to say she's you know part of folklore, uh, for, sort of folk history, but um, she died from tuberculosis in like 1892. And because other people in her family were getting tuberculosis, like one of the sort of like the folk superstitions in New England was that because you know, they didn't know what tuberculosis was. They thought that, you know, she was coming back at night and making her family sick, sort of energy vampiring them kind of thing. So in 1892, they the cure was to exhume her body, you know, check her heart. If it was full of blood, that meant she was doing this and then burn, burn the heart and have one of her, you know, family members who's getting sick, drink, <laughs> drink the ashes, you know, as a way to cure them, you know, and this actually happened. You can find articles in the Providence mm-hmm. journal about, you know, 1892 was sort of like the last time that sort of thing happened, but apparently similar exhumations like that happened like 30 or 40 times in the 18, 17, 1800s. Uh, so yeah, yeah, New England's got this weird little vampire sort of <laughs> folklore, which I had no idea. Like, uh, well, why didn't I know this before? I feel like her story has become it has become more popular, you know, in the last decade or so. It seems like more people know about Mercy Brown. Even like one of my favorite rock bands, a band called Clutch, who have been around for thirty years, put out a record last summer with a song called Mercy Brown. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So anyway, so there's <laughs> the short version of how I came up with the Paul Bearers Club. Actually, not that short. 
Wow. So you're talking about New England a lot. So how important has New England been to your writing? Oh, very. I mean, I've lived here my whole life. So honestly, part of it is <laughs> a little bit of me being a little bit lazy, like just because I know this area so well. But at the same time, you know, if you're going to be writing horror, what are, you know, why not use New England? Because you've already got like this set of expectations that are fun to play with, because you can either lean into those expectations or you can try to undercut them, um, you know, with this long sort of gothic tradition that that is, you know, here in mm -hmm. New England. So, yeah, I'm always drawn back to this area you know, for stories, because I think it's just fun to place them here. Mm -hmm. So how much research did you have to do for the Paul Bearers Club? Um, so, I mean, the main research or almost all the research was, you know, with Mercy Brown. So I read this amazing book. Do I have it here? I do. Don't mind me leaving the screen for a second. Uh, maybe I don't have it. Nope. Oh, yeah, here it is. <laughs> um, it's called Food for the Dead by Michael E. Bell. Oh. I don't see that. Um, it was funny. Whenever I found references to Murphy, uh, to Murphy Brown, <laughs> that's a different show. <laughs> to, uh, Mercy <laughs> totally. Brown. <laughs> um, yeah, and there's a lot online about it, but almost everything online references this book that Michael, you know, wrote. So it's not just about Mercy Brown, but he he sort of goes through like the weird vampire sort of superstitions and traditions, you know, throughout the history of New England. Uh, so yeah, it's a fascinating read, uh, and that was sort of my main text. Uh, that I use for research in terms of Mercy Brown's story. You know, but there were also, you know, I was able to find the newspaper articles um, that that talked about, you know, her her exhumation in the in the province journal and stuff like that. Wow. So what was your um what was your favorite research story in in all of your books? Do you have a favorite research story? Oh, I don't think so. I like I hate research. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah just because I'm not comfortable doing it like you know, when I, I went to college and, you know, I was a math major and, you know, even went to grad school and got my master's in math. So it wasn't like I ever, you know, outside of high school, I wasn't doing research papers and stuff like that. So, I you know, I've never felt mm -hmm. comfortable with, uh, you know, worse. I know some writers love research and actually use, you know, writing as a, an excuse to research deeply and they throw themselves into it. And I sort of envy that because I just don't, I don't know, I don't have, I don't feel like I have that muscle. But if you're writing fiction, you know, it, there comes a point where you have to do research. There's no escaping it. So I feel like I'm a, a reluctant researcher. Um, I will say for my novel Survivor Song, um, uh, I use my sister, who's a nurse at uh, Beth Israel Hospital in, um, in, in Boston. Uh, for that novel, I wanted basically one hospital is like a very localized response to what would it look like to have some weird outbreak? You know, I didn't want like the CDC and the mass government thing. Like we've seen that a million times. I want like, what would one hospital do? And so, you know, she was able to give me a lot of information about how their hospital would handle it. And in 2014, actually she and their hospital had a close call with Ebola. I don't know if you remember it, but there was a few Ebola patients in Massachusetts. Oh yeah. During that yeah. Class. And so like their, their hospital was going to be the hospital that, might get more if they showed up. Um, so I, I got to, you know, getting to do research with my sister was a joy because, you know, we have such a great relationship. Um, and then that joy turned into like stress and fear when like the book was weirdly coming out during the pandemic, you know, when she was overrun at the hospital. So uh, that was sort of like a very strange experience. Um, I guess the last bit, I can't, I don't want to say too much about this bit of research because it's a big spoiler for uh, Survivor Song. But I guess maybe the funniest bit of research was I emailed my kid's pediatrician to ask him a question, a really fairly gory question, a, med a fairly gory medical question that if I were to ask a random doctor, they would probably look at me and be like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, but he got a kick out of it and he gave me like a really detailed answer. So that was actually quite fun. <laughs> oh, okay. So what was the biggest challenge that you had in writing and putting out um, the Paul Bearers? Um, I mean, maybe just like writing it, like I wrote it in sort of the teeth of the pandemic in 2020. Um, yeah, you know, just trying to stay motivated because like everybody, there were like ebbs and flows of like, where it just felt like you were just so consumed with the news and everything that was happening. Um, yeah, it was just sort of hard to muster the, you know, the creative energy to sit down and write the book. But at the same time, I was glad I had that because, there, you know, there was a deadline. So I was like, I have to write this like there's a, you know, there's a deadline for this. So I'm, I'm actually very grateful that 
I had that deadline there because if it wasn't there, who knows if I would have wrote it. Um, that also said it was sort of a joy for the first time in my life. It felt like writing was a little bit of an escape. It, you know, it usually doesn't feel like that. Yeah. Um, you know, otherwise I think the biggest challenge was more for my publisher because of the formatting. Um, the fact that there are notes in the margins, um, beca what became an issue was the ebook. Uh, but we don't want your listeners getting ebooks anyway. We want them going to Annie's bookshop and buying physical yes, books. Thank you. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, I mean, that was sort of like a stress point because when the book was first published, uh, the ebook that they put out was unreadable. So there was a, like wow. a lot of one stars reviews uh, well, because they tried to replicate the notes in the margins and they could only do that by a static image, but you can't expand a static image on most Kindles. So people right. couldn't read. They couldn't read the book. Um, yeah. So that was kind of a mess. <laughs> oh, everything imagine. else about the book was, I don't know. The book was mostly sort of fun to write. I mean, it's very autobiographical. In some ways, I thought I was, I assumed I might be trying to exercise some some of the leftover demons of my high school experience. It didn't really work out that way because um, they're still there. <laughs> but uh, I am very proud of the book. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds great. So how, how often do you put yourself in the books? Oh, I mean, every book has got a little something of me in it um, or, you know, my experience. And I think that's true for everybody. I mean, I you know, the question often comes up with like younger writers or, if, you know, I was speaking to a high school class recently and they're always like, oh, how do you come up with something new? It's like, well, I don't necessarily worry about coming up with something new, um, you know, because I mean, zombie stories have done a million times. Vampire stories have been done a million times. And what, what makes it unique, hopefully, is the fact that you, the author, with your own unique set of experiences, wrote this and you you somehow mm -hmm. translate your experiences through the fiction. And that's what that's what makes something Ah, oh, wow, here's a, a quote unquote new take on a vampire. Well, it's new because it got filtered through that author's unique experience. Um, mm. You know, and it gets easier to trust that kind of thing. Like the more you write, you know, at the beginning, as a beginning author, I had all those same fears. Like, ah, oh, how am I going to come up with something new? You know, it takes a while to get to the point to be confident enough that like you have like sort of your own voice kind of thing. Um, I think I answered the question. I already just forgot what, what it was originally. <laughs> I still have, oh. I'm still like a week away from COVID. So I definitely feel like I have some COVID uh, brain fog going on still. Oh, wow. It was putting yourself into your books. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you did. Yeah. So you I would it. say, oh, right. So I'd say in this one for sure, like actually in, in this case, after writing that book, I was a little worried. It's like, man, I feel like <laughs> I'm always using myself for a lot of my books, but I feel like I emptied the bucket on this one. Um, <laughs> you know, but I had an author friend it's like, I oh, don't worry. The bucket will fill up again. You know, and they were right. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So now <laughs> tell me about a cabin at the end of the world. What do you want to know? <laughs> okay. What was the inspiration for it? First of all? Sure. So that one, it actually started with me thinking about a horror trope because uh, I was just, I don't write in my notebooks. Like I, I wish I could write longhand. I mean, I can physically write longhand, but I can't write my stories longhand. I need to be able to delete and move stuff around. But I'll use little notebooks just to sketch out ideas usually or, or try to brainstorm. And in this one notebook, I was half paying attention. I dueled the little cabin. No, I can't draw. So it was just like a rectangle and a triangle on it. You know, I drew the cabin. I was like, oh, you know, that made me instantly think of like a family isolated a cabin home invasion kind of story. Um, and those are like my typically my least favorite kind, partly because they are so scary and icky and so real. You know, partly because I think so many of the movies sort of just sort of focus on like the violence, torture part of it um, over story and over character. Not all of them. I mean, but, you know, there are um, home invasion stories that I do enjoy. But uh, I was actually weirdly excited by the by the challenge. Like, OK, you know, Mr. Big Mouth, how would you write a home invasion story that you'd want to sit through? Um and then I went through a little bit of like a logic exercise. Like, I don't know if I want to say necessarily because it would spoil, like it would spoil a big part of the book, but um, yeah. Uh, once I, I sort of landed on sort of the central conceit that these four strangers show up, you know, with a, an apocalyptic or possibly apocalyptic purpose, <laughs> uh, you know, that that's where the, the book sort of just grew out from there. Okay. Um, and for people who don't know, it was made into a movie. Correct. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not um, Knock at the Cabin. It's currently streaming on Peacock. Right. Yeah, direct, directed by M. Night Shyamalan. Wow. 
that how did you feel when you found out that it was going to be a movie yeah i mean it was very exciting uh i mean it was a long process and you know i've had other books optioned but none of them has made it all the way so you know, you sort of learn like cautious optimism because everyone in Hollywood says like the most exciting things all the time and everyone wants to be your friend and then you never hear from them again. So it's a very strange thing where like ghosting is like part of the professional, uh, <laughs> how they act, which is very strange. Um, but you know, there were certain points along the way cause the novel was optioned way back in early 2018. Um, wow. yeah. And then it was, you know, okay, so that's exciting. Uh, it was optioned. That's great. You know, then it took them like a couple of years to come up with a screenplay. Um, and then like in 2019, they had a, a couple of directors attached, but didn't work out with them. And that's when I first heard the name M. Night Shyamalan. It's not like he was interested maybe producing it. Uh, but again, it, what, there was nothing um, nothing concrete about that. You know, and then 2020 happened. But then it became, oh, okay, M. Night wants to make this movie, not only produce it, but make it. He has to finish his previous movie first. You know, so then I was waiting for his movie Old which came out, I think, the summer of 21. Yes, that's when it came out. But then, you know, things started ramping up. Uh, where it's like, oh, he's actually rewriting the screenplay. And then I talked to him November of 21 on the phone, where it's like, oh, yeah, we're going to start filming in the spring. And, you know, so that, that became very exciting. And, you know, I did get to visit the set in May of 22 for a couple of days. That was amazing. You know, never been on a movie set like that before. Uh, that was a little wild and like brain breaking, you know, just to see like this cabin that they'd built and the actors, you know, saying lines I'd written in the book. Um, wow. you know, that was really neat. So did, how much say did you have in the screenplay? Zilch. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I think yeah. So. yeah. The first, I mean, the first iteration they sent to me, this was before night was involved, you know, they, and I gave them notes, uh, you know, and suggestions, but they had no contractual obligation to follow any of those notes. Um, and then when Knight came aboard, I think he pretty much started from scratch for the most part, you know, when he wrote the screenplay himself. And I didn't get to see a screenplay until like after they were done filming, essentially. Wow. And did, did I hear they changed the end? Yeah, I'd say the first two thirds of the movie and the book are pretty much the same. And then the last thirds are, are different. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that must be strange to have your your work that, um, put on on screen and then have the ending totally different. Yeah, it is. I had a lot of time to sort of get used to that aspect of it. Um, like, even, you know, on the phone call I had with Knight in 2021, you know, he, he told me in broad strokes what he was going to be changing, you know, which oh, I sort okay. of which I which I sort of understand in some ways, you know, for a major studio, you know, that they weren't going to fully embrace the ambiguity aspect of the novel, although they did for a while in the book until it wasn't. Um, yeah, you know, you know, it's amazing. You know, the money was, you know, great. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'd say it's great, you know, not lie about it. You know, it's allowed me to, you know, take a year off from teaching. Um, but it is, I mean, it, as wonderful as it is, it is a little strange to think like, oh, this story, you know, they spent like 15 months writing essentially. Um, for most people, it's going to exist as the movie. You know, far more yeah. people are going to see the movie or already have, you know, than read the book. So it's like for most people, that's the that's the story, which is kind of weird to think about. I mean, it's, if it's a problem, it's a good problem to have, I suppose. But it is strange. Yeah. Uh huh. So what was the biggest challenge that you had in writing and and putting out um, the uh, let's say the, the cabin at the end of the world? Um, I don't know. I mean, I was, you know, again, fortunate to have. uh a book deal in place. Well, actually, that was the first book in a deal, um, in a, in a new deal. And, you know, the book, it's fairly short, you know, word count wise, what's it like 80,000 words, if that, um, but it, it, it felt like it was really slow writing, which is fine. Like, cause I really wanted it to, you know, I was really working to make it, you know, what I want it to be. So that, that book felt like it, it took a while to write compared to maybe some other books, even though it wasn't a very long book. Um, you know, so maybe that was the challenge, just like living with, uh, oh man, I only wrote like 200 words today or 300 words today, just to believe that, you know, well, those add up, even though those aren't, you know, very big word counts. Um, you know, it's funny, it's hard to remember the challenges in the afterglow of it being published. Like when, when you're in yeah. the middle of writing it, it feels like, ah, oh, this is terrible. I don't know if it's going to be any good, but my, so my publisher was super excited about the book. You know, once they saw it, you know, that was a big relief because I knew, I don't know, the, the book... <laughs> 
uh, has some asks for the reader and some pretty awful stuff happens. Uh, yeah, but you know, my editor was really complimentary. Okay, what about for um, for the Paul Bearers Club? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, part of it was just like letting that book go and letting it, you know, into the world and knowing it was much different than the previous two books, like Cabin and and Survivor Song have some sort of thriller elements, I suppose, or structure mm -hmm. to them. You know, especially in, in the fact that it you know takes place over a short period of time, mm -hmm. whereas the Paul Bearers Club was definitely is definitely different. It's much more interior. Um, you know, it's much more expansive in terms of timeline. It takes place over three decades. So, excuse me, it's not a thriller in the least. You know, no one should describe it as such. It's, um, you know, it's a little bit more contemplative and stuff like that. But, you know, but hopefully it's still, you know, my hope is it's still interesting and still fun to read. It's just a different type of book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I always want to be, hopefully I'm able to write different types of books. I don't want to write the same thing over and over again. Speaking about the future. What else can we expect from you in the near future? So, well, the paperback for Paul Bears comes out in a couple of weeks. Uh, the trade paperback, April 18th. Uh, I have a new short story collection coming out this summer. I'm holding it up for the video. Yes. Uh, the Beast You Are, that comes out July 11th. This is my arc. And for people that are watching and not listening, I <laughs> spilt water all over this, unfortunately. Uh, so I've, I've had this like under a pile of books next to my desk for like a good couple of weeks. And it, it's tamped down the the accordionness of it i don't know it's like a good battle scar so this is the book i'm going to use like if i read from it at at places and stuff like that so it's a short story collection that features a an original thirty thousand word novella um and the novella is uh, an anthropomorphic animal story um oh. i love watership down and secrets of nim uh animal farm so that novella is really sort of my love letter to those kind of stories um uh. Yeah, it features sort of like a hero dog, a cat that <laughs> is a slasher. There's also a giant monster. And I wrote it in free verse, the freest of all possible verse. Uh, wow. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to write. I hope I hope that translates to readers. Because uh, normally, like, I don't, writing's not fun. I'm addicted to when I have something finished. Uh, that's the part that I love. But no, it's not to say it was easy to write because, you know, it wasn't. I was definitely outside of my comfort zone in many areas. But also, I think that's partly why it was fun. It's like part of me is like, wow, I can't believe I'm trying this. <laughs> <laughs> it is fun to try different things, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Now I have questions for you about being a writer. What is your favorite part about being a writer on the whole writing and publishing process? Oh, man. Um, my favorite part. I mean, I mean, the joy of having something published is is fun. I mean, there's stresses to it too. I don't know. I mean, I guess I get to one. I get to, you know, feed the the weird compulsion that I have to write stories. Like it's hard to explain like why I want to sit down and write. Um, it, while it's still admitting like there are many days where I'm like, you know, I've written a bunch of good books. I can stop now and just imagine myself just laying on the couch and watching, <laughs> watching <laughs> TV and reading all the books. But you know, for whatever reason, I'm continued to be drawn back to. Uh, you know, to writing stories. Um, honestly, a lot of my writer friends inspire me. You know, that's the thing. My as a reader, my favorite books make me want to try something, even though like simultaneously I have that feeling of like, oh, I'll never be able to do something as good as Mariana Enriquez's Our Share of Night. But reading that book really made me want to write something. Uh, you know, and I hope I don't ever lose that feeling. If I do, I think I'll probably that's when it's time to stop writing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. So that's. My favorite part is just getting to join in on that, like, you know, almost two century long conversation of genre fiction. That's why I imagine anything, anybody, anybody writes something in horror, like all that a priori knowledge of what's come before you in horror is there. So to me, that's the fun part is just getting into join, you know, that the thought that my book might be read by someone who's read a bunch of Stephen King or Shirley Jackson. I mean, that that's a cool thing to me. Mm hmm. Okay. So what do you consider the most challenging part of writing? Um, uh, and how uh, do you overcome that? Uh, I mean, self-doubt is probably the most challenging part. Um, that's sort of been mm -hmm. a little bit of a disappointment that you would think, oh, you've been doing this for a while and you've published X number of books. You would think that part gets easier and it really doesn't. Um, <laughs> there's still that very much bipolar sort of mood swings as a writer from feeling like this is the best stuff I've ever written and like getting angry at people who don't like the book 
then at the same time, like I'm the worst, I should quit and delete everything I've just written. You know, most days you try to find the happy middle somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if it's gotten easier, which it hasn't, the only thing that's gotten easier is me being able to step back and recognize those feelings, which I think is important. Recognize them and be like, okay, you're being ridiculous, <laughs> but not beating yourself up too much. And then I think just by, just by recognizing those feelings, it makes it go away a little bit better. Um, as opposed to like really clutching and holding on to them and denying them, like denying that they exist. Um, but honestly, I think the other challenge is how much social media we have to deal with. Um, I mean, there are parts of social media I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy because, you know, I do enjoy interacting with other writers and, and readers, you know, but it's, you know, it takes over too much, you know, and there's a bunch of awful people clearly <laughs> on social media too. And, you know, I dream of being able to like leave it someday, but most writers can't like you sort of <laughs> have to do your own marketing or your yeah. own sort of promotion. And, you know, I necessarily mean that like a, just a coldly like monetary way, but it's just the fact of like publishing in 2023 that the publisher expects you to be out there um, and, and, and in a lot of ways rely on you getting the word out yourself via, via those, those avenues. But it's a hard thing to balance. I mean, it certainly eats up into eats into writing time too. Mm. Oh yeah, that's definitely true. Um, so what has been your favorite adventure during your writing career? Oh, uh, probably going to England in 2018. Um, uh. you know, I was never before writing, I was never very much of a traveler. Like I, I think I went on a plane for the first time in my life when I was like 21. Um, you know, so uh you know, when I was a kid, we would we lived in Massachusetts and would drive to New Hampshire for vacation or something like that. You know, which is we were able to do that, which is amazing. But you know, certainly wasn't a big traveler. So, getting to like actually go to uh, you know, as I mentioned, England, I did like a week long book tour there. That was incredible. Uh, last summer, even though I got COVID there, <laughs> going to Spain was you know wow, like you know that was able that happened because of my writing is just you know an absolute pleasure. And getting to go with other writer friends too is you know probably the best. The, the best adventures that I've had. So you're traveling then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what is the greatest lesson that you've learned during your writing career? Wow. Greatest lesson. Uh, persistence and patience for me. You know, every writer is going to have a different path, but you know, those have been sort of the, the key hallmarks for me is just to, to give myself permission to be patient. You know, whether that means spending two years to find an agent, um, whether that means not being in a rush to put a piece of work just out there, uh, you know, to self-publish if you think you can't, you know, if I didn't think I could get it published, you know, to be able to put away something that was getting rejected over and over again and maybe come back to it later, you know, and the persistence part of it is just, you know, to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. Um, you know, as a math teacher, I'll, I'll pull some math. <laughs> you know, just the idea that if the persistence part of it is if you just give if you try often enough if you give yourself enough opportunities the odds start to work in your favor that just one time it's going to work out like you only need one agent to say yes you only need one publisher to say yes you know it doesn't matter if a hundred or you know or, or three reject you you just need the one to say yes so that persistence part of it uh, i really believe in mm -hmm. so is that the piece of advice that you would give to other writers or do you have any other pieces of advice yeah. I, yeah, the patience part of it, I think for sure. Um, it, you know, it depends on what you want for like from your writing. Like, do you, you want the fulfillment of actually writing, or do you want to publish with like big pie publishers? You know, it depends on what you want from it. You know, if you want to publish with like you know the big New York City publishers, then like patience is a must. Like, you have to find an agent. Um, you know, there's really very few venues that will allow like an agent in submissions. You know, there's some windows that co that pop up occasionally, but you know, it's just a part of the, it's just a part of the, of the business. Um, and, and I think it's, it's harder to, to be patient because of social media. You see everyone talking about all the amazing things that they're doing. You know, it, it's, it's impossible not to feel like, oh my God, I, I'm not doing enough. I'm not, you know, I'm not publishing enough. I'm not writing enough. Um, you don't want those thoughts taking over too, because that'll, that'll put too much pressure on, you know, what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any clubs, groups, or organizations that may have helped you um, in your in your work that um, that you might recommend to other 
uh, other writers? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a member anymore. I left in like in 2009, but like when I first started writing, I was um, in the in the Horror Writers Association, and they had a mentorship program where they you know they hooked me up with a a writer that had been published, and you know that was definitely a big help to have. Uh, Steve Eller was his name. Have him reading a lot of my early short stories and giving comments and stuff like that. You know, that was very helpful. And I, I believe the HWA still has the the mentorship program. Uh, otherwise, I mean, it's been more me putting myself out there, going to conventions, you know, finding like a local group of friends who are also writers. And I mean, that part of it is, is you know, is has been super important in my development uh, and continues to be like I'm, you know, many of my closest friends are writers and it's just even if we're not necessarily talking about the books that we write or giving each other advice, just being able to share, share the struggle and frustrations, just to voice that to somebody else who's been through it is helpful. Okay, great. Um, now I have questions about you as a person. What is one thing that most people don't realize about you? <laughs> um, oh boy. I'm a big sports fan. You know, I don't talk about that much, <laughs> certainly not online because most horror readers and, and writers could care less, but that that's, that's my escape. People talk about reading as their escape reading. I do reading uh, like, cause that's one. I mean, it's partly cause I have to now. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to say that like, Oh, it's drudgery. Cause it's certainly not like I'm, I learned writing by reading other people. So I always have to be reading uh, and it's part of who I am. So sports for me is when I get to turn my brain off in a good way. Like that's the escape for me is, you know, watching sports it's just you know my family were all big sports fans so it was you know i was just sort of born into it um yeah so i think people probably would be surprised by how much sports stuff i consume <laughs> okay what question would you wish interviewers would ask you and what would your answer be oh man i don't know how this about how many what, what's your record for most three pointers made in a row and my answer would be 27 uh and that's the high school three-pointer not like the professional three-pointer <laughs> <laughs> okay and what is or are your passions when you're not writing um what, and how do you make time to do the things that you love yeah i mean well i mean so writing is a passion that's probably the number one passion so i mean it's good that i get to you know uh, do that um you know aside from obviously <laughs> hopefully being an attentive parent and husband um <laughs> uh i play guitar that's a fun you know that's sort of a fun hobby to do like uh, i'm definitely not that great of a player but you know i've been playing for a long time you know and that's a lot of fun you know just to hack around on the guitar uh you know i take my dog for you know fairly long walks every day so uh, you know i enjoy hiking we'll, we'll call that like a hobby slash passion too i go to borderland state park quite often it's like a 10 minute drive from my house um so that's something i enjoy especially this actually is starting to be the good time of year to do it now. Cause in the summer it's too hot, too buggy. <laughs> um, you know, and a lot of ticks too. So we're coming up mm -hmm. to a good month or so of good borderland hiking. <laughs> Great. Okay. So um, what does your writing space look like? And uh, what are the things, what do you need to have around you when you're writing or editing? Uh, so my writing space at home is a mess. <laughs> I'm not going to put the, the camera around because it is actually like a literal mess with boxes over here and, and stuff like that um so i'm at home like this is my area um but especially early on in my writing career it was wherever i could find space like i would often and i still do up would write at school during a free period um sometimes i'd write while the kids were taking a quiz or certainly edit while they're taking a quiz so to me that's like an important thing like i don't want any sort of writing rituals or or things like that, because I don't think those are helpful. Like that, that sort of, I think, trains you subconsciously in a bad way to think I can't write unless I'm doing this. I would much rather train my subconscious brain to just be like, okay, you're, you know, we're here, we have to work. Um, so I, you know, that said, I would say lately it's been in this main room here, but you know, sometimes I'll just change it up and go upstairs to my son's room. Cause he's in college, you know, just to have like a different vantage or if it's nice, I'll go out you know, I'll go outside, out back, in right outside too. Um, yeah. So actually, that would be one piece of advice. I was like, don't don't make yourself have rituals. Get used to the idea that you're a writer. You can write anywhere you want. You know, maybe you need ear earbuds to block out noise, which is something I'll do. You know, uh, my wife is working <laughs> from home, usually in the behind the behind the curtain back there. 
Uh, or I used to like if my son was at like a baseball clinic. I've re- I wrote a huge chunk of a novel there because every Saturday for two hours it was too long to drive him there and then drive home and then drive back to get him. I would stay there, but as you know, baseballs were whizzing around. I was sitting there writing. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't have to duck. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I wasn't. I, I wasn't that close to the line of fire, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> um so do you um do you listen to music obviously you don't you need you need silence uh well if i need to block out stuff i'll put music on but it has to be music without lyrics or without very many lyrics because i i tend to focus on those so i'll listen to a lot of like movie soundtracks um some classical music there's a composer named bela bartok that i listen to uh mm-hmm. when, when i'm writing but yeah I, I think i prefer silence but Almost, but it's getting to the point sometimes where there's always something going on in the house, so I have to listen to music. So I found that sometimes, like, I might need the music to help me fall into that hole. But uh-huh. I can do both. Okay. And do you have to have any particular um, drinks, like you know, water or coffee or and and food? No, I mean, I mean, this, the drink specifics are more specific to the time of day. Like when I wake up in the morning, I have to have a big cup of, I like coffee. So I have a, a big cup of Scottish, Scottish breakfast, Scottish morning, Scottish morning tea. I it's a black tea with the most caffeine in it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Otherwise it's just, you know, if it's the morning I have the tea. Otherwise it's just water Yeah, n- nothing specific. Otherwise. Okay. Um, you already sort of answered this question. Um, but um, writers often have uh, furry or feathered or otherwise non-human companions um, to uh, uh, to help them or hinder them through their work. Um, <laughs> and does yours help or hinder you? Oh, I'd say definitely help insofar that, that I've put Holly to work in many of the stories. She's here now snoring in the background down here. She's small, about 15 pounds. Uh, so never, <clears throat> never really a hindrance. But she's made multiple appearances in stories, including... I have a story in my collection, Growing Things, which came out in 2019, called Notes from the Dog Walkers, <laughs> uh, in which Holly is very much the star of that story. <laughs> what, what is her name? Holly. Holly. And yeah. what kind of a dog is she? Uh, she's a mutt uh, rescue, but she's probably mostly mini pincher. Like we actually did do like a doggy DNA test on her. And what was it like? <laughs> 40, 40% mini pincher, 30% rat terrier. And then little bits of like Chihuahua and Poodle or something. But if you look up oh. Red Mini Pincher, that's that's essentially what she looks like. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, I have two more questions, the last questions uh, for okay. you. Where can, pu- where can people find your work? Side from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester. And I have to do a plug for Annie's at every... Absolutely. Um, at every uh, video, and you can get Paul's books at Annie's if you call us at, at 508-796-5613, or you can uh, you can um, email us at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. And where else can people find your books? I mean, pretty much wherever books are sold, So, uh, but go for Annie's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And my last question is, how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? <laughs> uh, well, so, I mean, if we're talking, I get, well, one, I have a website on which you can sign up for a free newsletter. Um, so it's paultremblay.net. Uh, and I, my newsletter is once a month, sometimes a little bit longer. So I, I promise I'm not like frequently spamming your, your email inbox. Um, otherwise I'm on Twitter at Paul G. Tremblay and, uh, and, and, Instagram at Paul G. Tremblay as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me today. And, well, thank you, Selena. Uh, and hopefully we will uh, we will be seeing you at our store sometime soon. Yeah, great. Would love to. Thank you very much, Paul Tremblay. <laughs>